So we're in Matthew chapter 17. The title of the sermon is Elijah Must Come First. Elijah Must Come First, chapter 17, verses 9 through 13. But let me go back and just pick up verse 5 as we get into our text today. Verse 5, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked Him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? Verse 11, And He answered, Elijah does come. And he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but they did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. And then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So the disciples understood he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So an interesting text. This, we're still in the transfiguration. Moses and Elijah have appeared with Jesus, but they were transfigured. They went through a, 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 a transformation, and we got to see an image that would represent God's glory, the ideal way that God wanted His people. Uh, so now I want to take the, the second half of the transfiguration and the disciples have this question, well, wait a second, I don't understand what you're doing, Jesus, because I thought Elijah had to come first. So that reveals to us that these first century Jewish people had an idea of what we call eschatology. Eschatology is how things are supposed to unravel. What is the step-by-step -step procedure of God ushering things in? And they had this idea, and they're, they're thinking that things are happening out of order, that something that hasn't happened yet uh, is supposed to happen first, but Jesus says, oh, no, oh, oh, you guys missed it. The things that you think need to happen still have already happened. Uh, even today, guys, when it comes to eschatology in the church, there are different points of view uh, of eschatology. Uh, this, what we're talking about today, is called a realized eschatology. A realized eschatology is that most of the biblical prophecies and promises were all fulfilled in Jesus. And so a realized eschatology means we believe that the Bible has already fulfilled the things that it said it would fulfill other than the final coming of the heavenly Jerusalem down out of heaven. And that's what Jesus is going to say. That stuff has already happened, and you guys just missed it. So we're going to look a little closer at that idea. <clears throat> Three things to watch for in the sermon topic that I think are important. Verse 5, listen to Him. That's a critical part of our pericope. Verse 9, don't tell anybody what you've seen. Now, that's an interesting comment on Jesus' part. And verse 10, Elijah has to come first. So we'd like to look at all three of those things. That's going to make our text come to life today. So let me give you the first one. Verse 5. Sorry, that's wrong. Verse 5, listen to him. What's the point of God... When Moses and Elijah are besides Jesus, God's specifically saying, listen to my son. And basically what it's talking about is who's going to have authority going forward. As God's plan unrolls, we already have seen that the scribes and the Pharisees are the spiritual leaders. They absolutely have authority. And later on in chapter 23, is it chapter 23? I believe it is. But Jesus is going to say, yeah, you have to listen to those guys because they sit in the seat of Moses. They're the ones revealing to you what Moses taught to you. And he said, but don't do what they do because they are horrible examples of living up to God's righteous standard. So you've got the scribes and the Pharisees that are the authorities and 
in that day and age, I mean, that would be like telling uh, someone in the Catholic faith, the Pope has no authority. It's going to take them a while to wrap their mind around that idea. So that's what he's doing. In addition to that, you've just, the disciples have just seen Moses and Elijah. <clears throat> and the concept is they vanish, but Jesus remains. And God says, listen to him. So even Moses and Elijah have lost their authority because Jesus is the one that we listen to now. There's a lot that goes into that. Uh, the voice from heaven, Matthew 17 and verse 5 said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Put a square around this. This is a significant part of the pericope. Listen to Him. Where do those words come from? Do they have any significance? Did the Old Testament ever tell us that something like this was going to come about? So, let's look at where it comes from. Let's go back to Deuteronomy 18 and verse 15. If you were here this morning, you're already an expert on this verse, but we'll look at it again today. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18, 15. Why does Jesus' authority replace the authority of Moses and the prophets and we'll find our answer here. Uh, Moses even prophesied that one day this was going to happen. One day another prophet was going to come because the word that you're hearing from God right now, Moses was saying, and let's put ourselves in their shoes. They were at Mount Sinai. There was thunder. There was lightning. There were dark clouds. There was fire. And anybody that got too close to the mountain died. Now, that's a terrifying way to come into the presence of God. And fundamentally, God recognizes you're right. This aspect of the eschatological plan is absolutely terrifying because as we already studied in Deuteronomy, if you mess up, you die. That sums up the Mosaic Covenant. And that's what people were witnessing. Fire, thunder, lightning, and death. We're terrified. We don't like this method. And God says, it's okay for them to say that because I'm going to replace fire and lightning and death with righteousness in the future. But you're going to have to wait for that prophet to arrive. Because when that prophet arrives... He'll teach you about righteousness and you won't have the thunder and lightning and earthquakes and dying. So listen to him when he comes. And in addition to that, he says, oh, by the way, even though his ministry is going to be much more to your liking, should you decide to reject his words, you will die. So let's look at it. Verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst you, from your brothers, and it is to him that you shall listen. Put a square around that and then send yourself back over to Matthew 17 and verse 5. You shall listen to him. Verse 16, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Oh, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see His great fire anymore, lest I die. Verse 17, And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. So I will raise up for them a prophet like you from amongst their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all that I command him. And, verse 19, whoever will not listen to my words that he will speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That means I will cut him off. I will destroy the person who refuses to listen to what I have to say. You guys don't like what I have to say through Moses because it's terrifying and people die. 
You're going to love what I have to say through my new prophet, which we all know to be Jesus here. That's what the transfiguration said. Listen to him. He's the guy. You're going to like his message. His message will be a message of reconciliation. His message will be a message of forgiveness. His message will be a message of joy, and He's going to be telling you exactly what I want Him to tell you. And the good thing is He's going to say it exactly the same way I command Him to say it, and He's not going to add anything to it, and He's not going to take anything away from it. Listen to Him. But if you don't like his message, then yeah, there is death and destruction in store. <clears throat> I think that there's something prophetic about the people going, we can't handle this version of God. And God says, okay, I'm going to bring you a, a different version. In the Bible, uh, the Old Testament is called the ministry of death. And it's called that because it was impossible. It would take a while for us to understand. Then why did God give us the Old Testament? If I was to summarize it really quickly, guys, it had nothing to do with the people. There's so much to it. But if I was to use a broad brush, I would say the, the purpose of the Old Testament, as brutal as it was, Paul tells us that the purpose of the Old Testament was to flush sin out into the open. It treats sin, it personifies sin. It treats sin like a person. A person who's figured out the system, and because they figured out the system, they're going to be able to trick every single portion of creation, and creation is going to be destroyed because sin has figured out how to deceive. And God said that happened because of the law. So what the law, the purpose of the law was to flush sin out of its secret hiding place, to bring sin out into the open. And once sin was out into the open, God could nail it to a cross and get rid of it once and for all. So now we don't live in fear of this message of fire and thunder and lightning and a voice that we can't stand and a fear of death. Because God lured sin out of its secret place and nailed it to a cross. So he no longer speaks to us in that way. He speaks to us a new ministry that the Bible calls the ministry of righteousness. And in that ministry, you don't die because of your sins. You are forgiven of sins. You're reconciled back to God. He woos us back to him. God has fixed what ruined our relationship with him. And so that is a glorious ministry. And Paul is going to tell us that the Old Testament, the covenant of Moses, was glorious because it was God's rules. But when Christ came, what was once glorious has faded away because of the surpassing glory of this new thing that God does through Jesus. This new thing that God has accomplished through Jesus is so beautiful and awesome and mysterious that he says that first covenant doesn't even shine anymore. Let me show you where Paul actually says that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9. Two ministries, a ministry of condemnation, which is what Moses gave us, and a ministry of righteousness and reconciliation, which is what Jesus gave us. He says in verse 9, For the ministry of condemnation was glorious. Oh, if the ministry of condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry of righteousness Indeed, what was once glorious has no glory now in comparison to the glory that surpasses it. For if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which endures? And fundamentally, Paul is comparing the Mosaic Covenant, a ministry that had its glory 
but it was a ministry of condemnation and death. Again, the purpose was to lure sin out into the open so Christ could, so God could nail that to the cross and get rid of it. And he says, but the new ministry, Jesus' ministry, a ministry of righteousness that reconciles people back to God is so glorious. It's God's best work that that old ministry fades in comparison. The law couldn't make anyone righteousness. The law condemned everyone as sinners and God figured out a way how to get rid of that condemnation. So listen to him. He's the one now. And he's going to give you my words exactly the way I command him. So we see in eschatology, God had a word for people through Moses. But God also says, I'm going to have another word for you. Eschatologically, Jesus is going to bring a new word from me. And you're going to love that new word. All right, that's the first one. Number two, tell no one of what you've seen. Again, we've got an eschatologic problem. The reason, let me read it for us. Uh, Verse 9, Jesus commanded them, tell no one of the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. The whole reason why Jesus didn't want the disciples going and saying, here He is, here's the Messiah, He's here, guys, is because they did not yet know God's eschatologic plan. Their picture of eschatology was a little bit not correct. They've already said, well, we thought Elijah was going to come first. So it's obvious that they don't understand what God is doing yet. So he said, don't go tell him, people, because you're going to give them the wrong message. Wait until after my suffering. Wait until after my resurrection. And then you're going to have the full picture. We know that they didn't understand the eschatology because twice Peter wants to interfere with God's eschatology. When Jesus said he had to suffer, Peter says, no way, I'm not going to let that happen. Uh, Peter, you're acting like Satan right now. You're getting in the way of how things are supposed to go. Get behind me, Satan. And then later on, Peter is going to pull out a sword in the garden, and he's going to try to create his own eschatology again. He's going to try to direct God's eschatologic plan. He's going to try to direct it himself by pulling out a sword and saying, let's start stabbing some people. And that's why Jesus said, you guys, please don't say anything until after my resurrection because you don't have a picture of the proper eschatologic plan. Number three, first, Elijah must come. Verse 10, the disciples asked him, then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? This concept of eschatology, they are correct. In fact, let's look at where this comes from. Why were the scribes and the Pharisees teaching that Elijah would come first before the kingdom? And they get it from Malachi chapter 4. And it would be great for us to be very familiar on the front title page of your Matthew book. You ought to write Malachi chapter 4, 5 through 6 at least, because Matthew's purpose is to tell us Malachi is being fulfilled. Matthew shows us the fulfillment of Malachi's prophecy. So let's go look at it. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Let me just pause right there real quick, guys. The great and awesome day of the Lord is always a day of wrath and destruction. That's another one of those verses that appears all throughout the Old Testament. And the prophets are always saying, the day of the Lord is coming. Who will be able to stand? Who will be able to stand in that day? 
And then what happens next? The Assyrians come and destroy the northern ten tribes. Another prophet, the day of the Lord is coming, you better repent. But they don't. The Babylonians come and destroy Jerusalem. Joel chapter 2 said there's going to be tongues and prophecies and signs and wonders before the great day of the Lord. Joel chapter 2 is prophesying A.D. 70 when Jerusalem comes to just when the Romans come to destroy Jerusalem. Malachi here is saying the same thing. I'm going to send you Elijah before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. The language of turning hearts of fathers to children and hearts of children to fathers is the language of repentance, reconciliation, So I'm going to send a messenger, I'm going to send Elijah to turn your hearts back to God before the great and awesome day of the Lord, before destruction. And whoever refuses to repent is going to suffer the day of the Lord, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So they are saying, they are keying in and they go, wait a second, wait a second, Doesn't Elijah need to come first? So just like today, there was confusion about the order of things. And let's just go back. Our passage today makes it clear, but let me go back. This is the second time Jesus has to deal with the idea of a prophet like Elijah coming. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 11. That's the first time Jesus explains to them the nature of Elijah coming back first. Matthew chapter 11, we'll start in verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force, because all of the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The reason he says he who has ears to hear, let him hear is because Isaiah also prophesied that there would come a time when God would blind the eyes of Israel, stop up the ears of Israel, Isaiah chapter 6, so that seeing they will not be able to see, hearing they will not be able to hear because the destruction of Jerusalem has already been slated and there's nothing you can do about it. Jesus earlier The the disciples asked Jesus, why do you speak in parables? It confuses everybody and they don't know what you mean. And Jesus goes, yeah, exactly. To you, it has been given to understand the things about the kingdom. But to them, it has not been given. Jesus will say in the book of Matthew, no one can come to me unless God the Father teaches them directly. There was a hardening that had come on Israel as part of God's eschatologic plan. So he says, Elijah is the guy Micah was talking about. Not all of you are going to be able to see it. Not all of you are going to believe it. But to God's elect, to the ones that God teaches, to the people that God reveals himself to, they'll be able to accept. Elijah was the prophet. He goes on in our passage today, Matthew 17 and verse 11, and he answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him. All right, that's the sermon, guys. I would say we'll put a pin right there, but instead let's put a pin right there and I want to give you, that's the sermon, that's the, that's the pericope, but I want to give you, since our, 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 our I, I uh, wanted to grab this section in particular because it talks about eschatology, how things are supposed to unravel, unwind, and it shows us that people get it wrong. They had it wrong, God, Jesus had to explain stuff, and people today, unfortunately, have some things wrong. If you've ever heard about uh, a rapture 
happening where the church is taken to heaven and then all kinds of tribulation is going to happen on the earth. It's going to be horrible. You better hope you're raptured. That's an interpretation of eschatology that is not the one that we share, but it's very, very popular. If you remember the book series Left Behind, do you know that that book says right on it, fiction, and yet it has become scripture? For people, it's unfortunate. There's an element of fear in all of that. Uh, and I won't go so much into that, but there is a lot of eschatology that's incorrect today. Uh, so let me run you through the book of Isaiah. We're just going to kind of comb through Isaiah really quickly. I'm just going to highlight just a few of the chapters in Isaiah because in Isaiah, Israel was undergoing something horrible. They had already seen their northern ten tribes exiled by the Assyrians. And if you don't know this, the Assyrians were horrible, torturous people. It's unimaginable the tortures that they exhibited on those ten tribes. Here's the thing, though. Judah, the other two tribes down below, witnessed Assyria taking them. And Isaiah says, you better learn from that lesson. And Isaiah gives Jerusalem 150 years to learn what happens when we don't in, embrace righteousness. They didn't learn the lesson. So Babylon came and destroyed and took them into exile. So people just don't learn. So Israel at this point in the book of Elijah, they are suffering, they are bad, they feel like God has abandoned them because horrible, horrible things are happening to the nation of Israel. Where is our God? Don't you see us suffering? Don't you see what the nations are coming in and doing to us? Where are you? So Israel felt abandoned by God. And so part of what Isaiah weaves into his narrative is in the future, God is going to do some glorious things. Right now, you guys are slated for destruction, but in the future, God has got some glorious things on the horizon. So let me share those with you. Isaiah chapter 1, as we begin the book of the prophecy, there's this wonderful little verse in here, Isaiah 1 and verse 26. Here is a look to the future for a nation who thinks God has abandoned them. About halfway through verse 26, it says, And afterwards you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion, which is Jerusalem, the holy mountain, shall be redeemed by justice. And those in her who repent by righteousness. He says, there is coming a day where the mountain that you guys are familiar with, Mount Zion, the holy hill of Jerusalem, God's holy mountain, God is going to do something that is going to be so amazing. And in that day, instead of Jerusalem being marred by destruction and wrath because of their stiff-necked hard-heartedness and rebellion and sin, he says, boy, there's going to come a day where that mountain is going to be marked by righteousness, by justice. There's going to be people that are going to repent and turn from that old way, and it's going to be glorious. So glorious, in fact, that the city is going to be called that city of righteousness. That faithful city, which... Jerusalem has never lived up to yet. Someday, he says, if we fast forward to Isaiah 52. In Isaiah 52, Isaiah 52, we're going to start in verse 6, but Isaiah 52 is going to speak of the return of God to Zion. Now, that makes sense to us. We hold on to that because Israel's feeling is because Assyria has devastated us because Babylon has devastated us. God has left us. And God says, you're right. I've turned my back on you for a little while, but I am going to return 
to Jerusalem. Verse 6, Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who speak. Here I am. How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. <clears throat> Verse 8, the voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice, together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. God promised that he would come back. And that is why we call Jesus Emmanuel. God is with us. So the fulfillment of God returning to Israel happened through the person of Jesus, the third person of the Godhead. God himself returned to Jerusalem through Jesus. Not everybody saw that. But that is what he promised would happen. If we go from God returning to Jerusalem, let's move to Isaiah chapter 53, and the story takes a very strange turn. You would think that once God returns to Jerusalem, that's going to fix everything. Everything will be fixed. But Isaiah 53 weaves in a very strange antithesis, an antithetical, anticlimactic, event that's going to happen after God's return. Isaiah 53 and verse 5. He'll be pierced for our transgressions. He'll be crushed for our iniquities. Upon him is the chastisement that brings us peace. And with his wounds will be healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Isaiah 53 pictures the beauty of transitioning away from the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, fire, thunder, lightning, and death. The thing that everybody said is terrifying. Please don't talk to us like that anymore. But we see here, someone is going to be pierced. And through his chastisement, through what happens to him, verse 5, we're going to get to experience peace. We're going to get to experience reconciliation. The thunder and the lightning and the condemnation are gone. Romans said there is no more condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It might be, I hope we can appreciate the glory because we grew up hearing the message of reconciliation and joy and righteousness because we grew up with Jesus. But can you imagine people that suffered under that ministry of condemnation. Like David said, oh, we look forward to that day when God no longer holds a man's sins against him. David was saying, wow, I have no idea what that looks like. That's going to be cool. And here it is. His crushing is what brought all of us peace. Next chapter, Isaiah 54, after the crushing, we get a, another image of this beautiful city. Let's remember that he brought it up in chapter 1 first. The city will be called righteous. You'll be called the faithful city in that day. Chapter 54 and verse 11. O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I'll set your stones in antimony. That's a precious stone. I'll lay your foundations with sapphires. I'll make your pinnacles of agate, 
your gates of carbuncle and your walls of precious stones. Right there, I would highlight that whole section and send yourself over to Revelation chapter 21. Anybody remember of a city in Revelation that's made out of gold and agate and pearl and precious stones? Isaiah saw it too. Isaiah saw it too, verse 13. And all of your children shall be taught by the Lord. Great will be the peace of your children, and in righteousness you'll be established. There'll be a completely different ministry that's going to get preached to you in that day. And what he says here is he says, God Himself is going to teach you. God Himself is going to open your awareness of His will. Now it's interesting, hard for us to accept this idea of hardening. That in the first century, a hardening had come over people. And just like the apostles, there was no way for them to realize what God's eschatologic plan really was going to look like unless God Himself opened their eyes to allow them to see what He was doing. Not everybody was going to have their eyes open. Do you remember when Jesus asked Peter, Peter, who do you say I am? You're the Son of God, the Christ. What did Jesus answer him? Oh, Peter, you're lucky. You're so lucky because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father in heaven has revealed that to you. God opening people's eyes in that first century was what Isaiah talked about. They will be taught by God Himself. Anybody who had their eyes opened and were able to see Jesus as the Son of God, as the Messiah, had the grace and peace that God was the one opening their eyes to see it. Jesus said, nobody can come to me unless my Father opens your eyes. First century, that was unique because there was a hardening that was happening to Jerusalem at that time. Uh, let me show you a text. John 6 is what tells us that that's what was meant. Uh, he's going to quote Isaiah in this passage, John chapter 6 and verse 44, when Jesus said, Nobody can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. So whoever has heard from the Father and learned from Him, that's the guy that accepts me as the Messiah in Christ. You might want to cross-reference John 6 there, back over to Isaiah. Back over to Isaiah 54 and 13, because that's the fulfillment of Isaiah. I am going to teach them directly myself. And Jesus says, anybody who comes to me, comes to me because you have been taught by the Father. God has revealed me to you. We should rejoice as we sit in this room, having been drawn to Jesus, recognizing that God has intervened in your life and God has taught you directly that His Son is the Messiah. Not everybody recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. So this is all beautiful. This city made of agate and pearls and fine gems, that represents the opposite of a city that smolders and charcoal because they've been burnt. Smoldering and charcoal is for unrighteous cities, unrighteous nations and countries. Fire and smoke and charcoal. But when God establishes righteous people, you're going to live in this city that's beautiful beyond belief because that's what righteousness deserves is this unimaginable beauty. So, 
how do we talk about this city, Zion, a Jerusalem, that is going to be called that faithful city, that righteous city. It's going to be built out of fine gems. How do we harmonize that with the idea that the day of the Lord is coming to destroy Zion, the holy hill? Isaiah painted this glorious, beautiful picture, but we sure don't see it as we look back historically. Let's deal with that. The first aspect of dealing with that is Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. You may want to pay attention and, and make sure you can duplicate what I'm about to share with you because if you know what I'm about to share with you, it will change the eschatology that some people have about modern day Jerusalem. This is it, guys. The first thing is Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And in Matthew 24, 25, I forget, it's right in there. Jesus says, yeah, look at Jerusalem, look at the temple. Not a single stone is going to be left on top of another one. So it's looking like Jerusalem is not the place we think God is going to transform. Well, then where is the Jerusalem that God was talking about through the prophets? Is it the literal physical Jerusalem? Or is it something else that gets revealed later? Paul is going to tell us in Galatians chapter 4, this is the verse that you're going to want to equip yourself with and see if it reveals something to you. Paul is going to say that Abraham had children from two different women. Hagar, the slave woman, and her and her children are not a part of the kingdom. Then there's Sarah and her son. And the promises come through Sarah and her son. Up to today, modern day Israel, Jerusalem, thinks they are the children of Sarah. And that the promise is for them. But Paul says, no, you guys are the children of Hagar. Because you guys are slaves to sin. You guys don't look anything like your father Abraham. You don't realize you guys are the slaves. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 25. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. Remember thunder, lightning, earthquake, death, and condemnation. And that is what corresponds to present-day Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above, that's the free Jerusalem. That is our mother. Verse 27, he's going to quote here Isaiah 54. John 6, they'll all be taught by God, took us back to Isaiah 54. Here in Galatians, talking about the Jerusalem, that city called righteousness, the city called faithful, takes us back to Isaiah 54 to remind us of the city that God promised. Verse 27, for it is written, Rejoice, O barren woman who bears no children. That was Sarah. Break forth and cry aloud, you who have never travailed, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who had a husband. The woman that couldn't have children, the barren woman that was unable to bear fruit, God says, you rejoice. Because that's the Jerusalem we belong to the Jerusalem that is above, the Mount Zion that is above. That will correct a lot of improper eschatology. A popular word for that improper eschatology is called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism. And that verse right there will correct those inaccuracies for you. So now... I want to leave you with a little glimpse of hope. So what do we do then? It's not Jerusalem. It's not the physical city, the present-day Jerusalem. 
It is a Jerusalem that is up above in heaven, made of jewels. In that place, there's only righteousness. Nothing evil, wicked can enter into that place. But what good does that do us? We don't know until we get to Revelation. Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God, its radiance was like rare jewels, like jasper, like clear crystals. Verse 24, by its light, the nations will walk and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, but nothing unclean will ever enter into it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. The city that was promised in Isaiah the Zion, the holy mountain, the, the, the city of Jerusalem that was promised is not the Jerusalem that exists today. It's a Jerusalem, a, a mountain that exists in the heavens. It's perfect. It's beautiful. It's unmarred. And nothing detestable will ever get into it. But one day, one day God is going to bring it down to us. And for that reason, Jesus teaches us to pray, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. Our job, Jesus says, is to give people that righteous worldview so that we're already living as though we were in the city called righteousness so that we're already living as though we were already in the city called faithful, so that we're already in that city where nothing unclean is allowed. Jesus tells us we need to be living that way already here, and we need to be teaching our community to obey His commandments, to live as though we are already in the righteous city, because when the righteous city finally comes down out of heaven, only righteous people are going to be able to dwell there. And that's our ministry, is to try to bring people to righteousness so that they can enter the city called righteousness.